You conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom. Awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name. That's a great song. I like that. Uh, welcome to Christ's Hope. My name is Steve Vincent. I'm the interim minister, and what a great day to worship God. Uh, you know, we just sang, God has done great things, and guess what I'm going to ask you? What great things has God done? Don't just shake your head at that song and sing along. Has he really done something great, or you just, well, the words were on the screen. That's what I said. What great thing has God done in your life, maybe this past week, maybe recently? What sticks out to you? And I'll start while you're processing, which means you don't really have to listen to me. But uh, this last week, uh, just had a chance, things lined up to take a step of faith. And it's one of those steps of faith, sometimes you're like, you know, I guess they all make you a little anxious, but it's like, I, I sort of want to do this, but it's a true step of faith. And so, like, thanks God for one, testing my faith in a way that you know, sort of is nice, so, but still anxious causing, anxiety causing, anxiety producing, something like that. But he shows, he's there. What great thing has God done in your life this week or recently? Men's Fellowship, Men's fellowship. wasn't that nice? Yeah, that was a really great time, uh, you know, around the campfire and eating yak and elk and bison and yeah, you just feel like a different man. You start out, you know, you eat bison and yak and alligator the last night, you know. Yeah, you're ready to conquer anything. That was good. Anyone else? What's God done this week? I, boy, we should like, I, I got to shut you up. Like, stop talking. We got to get on. He made it possible for my nephew to uh, be in Arizona with his mother who's going through uh, liver cancer treatments. And, and so she needed him and he needed her. Awesome. That it is all, great. I'm sure that means a lot to both of them. So that's great. He allowed me to see my image in the mirror this morning. There you go. That's something we shouldn't take for granted, and often we do. We'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah, God's given us life. Well, I want that to be, you know, in your mind. You sing a song, start thinking about, yeah, what has God done? And tell you what, you'll have a chance to do it later because we're going to sing that song uh, at the end of the service. So welcome. Let's stand together. That the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child.
chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Say that again. I am chosen, not forsaken.
depths as far as east is from the west so far your grace has carried me until i see you face to face until at last i've won my race remind me you're not finished yet His body crucified to make me whole again. That uh, line from verse 1 of that song nicely summarizes what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And it also reminds me of the words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. The prophet writes, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. Yet he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This memorial of the Lord's Supper, it reminds us of what Jesus has done for us at the cross. And it reminds us of the pain and the suffering and the punishment that was to be on us that that we deserved. Jesus took that pain and that suffering that we deserved and he placed it on himself. He took it upon himself and he bore that pain and that suffering and that punishment so that we didn't have to. He bore it for one purpose, this uh, song tells us and Isaiah 53 tells us, and that was to heal us, to take us in our broken state, and to make us whole again. The bread and the cup remind us that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice that God required in order to cleanse us and to heal us and to make us whole. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the perfect sacrifice of your son Jesus. We find salvation in his blood. We thank you for the suffering and the pain and the uh, just excruciating embarrassment and uh, everything that he went through at the cross, the punishment that he endured. And uh, we just thank you so much for that. Help us to remember that certainly right now as we partake of this bread and this cup that reminds us of what he did at Calvary. But help us to live lives in constant remembrance Help us to never forget that sacrifice that Jesus made for us and help us to uh, allow that fact of Jesus' sacrifice to uh, cause us to live in a different way and live according to your will and live really in true gratitude of uh, what he's done for us. We thank you so much for everything that he's done and the many blessings that you give to us because of what Jesus has done. It's in his name that I pray, amen. I did want to say one last time, if you want to come to the How to Study the Bible class today, I'm going to run off copies after uh, church, and we'll have that class start at 1230, so just sign up on the sheet out there so I know how many copies to run off. Well, we are in the middle of Stewardship Month. You knew that, and you still showed up today, so you're to be commended for that. 
I've had people agree, like, you know, stewardship isn't like the most exciting subject, uh, but I've also heard people say that they've appreciated some of the foundational stuff that we've looked at, so I, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and the very first foundational thing we had to talk about uh, when we started the series was, so what does the word even mean? What is stewardship? And, and at first we need to, to clarify, what does stewardship not mean? This is when you answer. <laughs> that part about not listening to me while you were thinking that was in the beginning. Now you're now it's time to listen. What does stewardship what do we usually think of when we think of stewardship? Give money. Give money and especially yeah, money. Giving money. Yeah, it, it doesn't mean that. Certainly the word doesn't mean that. What does the word stewardship mean? Manage. Yeah, to manage. A steward is a manner. Stewardship a manager. A stewardship is managing. And so it includes that idea of money, but that's not the focus. What is the real focus, the underlying uh, focus of stewardship? Relationship. relationship with God. Yeah, because stewardship is a matter of our heart and our commitment to God. And so that's going to be the key trait of our relationship. It, what, how we steward, the type of steward that we are, really shows what our relationship with God is is like. And so that's the true focus. And then the foundation we looked at last week, you know, if we are managers, if we're stewards, that's because God is the owner. And he is the owner of everything, including us, and certainly our money, our time, every ability we have to, to earn money, all of that. God is the owner because he created us and because he redeemed us. And then also because, you know, we talked about he sustains us. He didn't just create and then stand back. He's still sustaining us. So all of that we have looked at so far, but then the question still comes up, okay, what does stewardship look like? What does it look like in practice? And the general main idea that we've had since the beginning still applies here. Stewardship is living out and living by my Christian faith. That's what it looks like in general. I am living out this faith that I have in Christ, in God. That's what my stewardship is. All right, but let's get more specific. We're going to talk about the two key areas today. First of all, stewardship of money. And I purposely didn't say my money because it's not ours. God's the owner. We're the manager. That's the inherent principle that we've looked at so far about stewardship. But the big question when it comes to stewardship of money is... How much exactly? Now, I'm glad you said how much. That's a neutral statement. You know, you can word it in a way, how much should I give or how much do I have to give? And that says a lot about your, your relationship with God, really. It goes back to that main idea of stewardship is living out and living by my Christian faith. Well, my Christian faith says that I believe there's a God who created me to have a relationship. I believe that my sin separated me from that God, but God said I still want to have a relationship so much that I myself, God the Father's Son, God Himself, Jesus came to die for us. We accept that salvation, I would say, with gratitude, with joy. Do we live that out? That's what we're talking about. And if I say, how much do I have to give? Yeah, it's like, all right, what's this going to cost me? This salvation stuff. What am I in for? Do you have a payment plan? Uh, that's the wrong attitude right there. That says something that is missing right there. You know, Colossians 2.6 says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Well, again, I would hope we received Him with this humble, gracious, you know, this attitude of gratitude, this joy. All right, well, keep walking that way. Keep living that way. If we miss this, you know what, no amount, you know, the thing we're all interested in today, how much, no amount will be right if our heart isn't right. And when it says God loves a cheerful giver, that's not just a cute phrase. <laughs> God really does love someone who it brings joy to give, and that needs to characterize us. And so we still are left with that question, though, what is the standard for giving? Well, let me say this, it's not what you think. Because most people, if I asked you what's the standard for giving, the answer would be 10%, which is a tithe. That's what that word tithe means. I hear some people say, you know, I tithe 12%, I tithe 15%. Well, no, you tithe plus or whatever. Tithe means a tenth, 10%. But that is not the standard that the New Testament specifies. Nowhere in the New Testament does it specify that Christians are to give a tithe. And I think most people realize that. It doesn't just come out and say, you're to give a tithe. But it's often 
inferred or said that, you know, the New Testament implies that. Well, does it? And I tell you what, I used to say the same thing, but based on the same, there's really three arguments you want to say, three points of, uh, you know, the people would, points of evidence people would point to. Uh, the first one is that the tithe was the standard under the old covenant, and we're under the new covenant, which is best. So if they gave 10%, we should give at least 10% ourselves, if not more. And that sounds reasonable until you think about it some. First of all, the tithe was not the standard under the old covenant. Well, the other thing we need to realize is because we're going to talk about this is the old covenant is when we talk about that, it's not the same as the Old Testament. Now, the words mean the same. Covenant and testament are, mean the same thing. But the Old Testament is what we think of with that group of books that's in the first half or first two-thirds of the Bible, and then the New Testament is that second half. Well, the Old Covenant didn't start until Moses in Exodus uh, 20 when he receives the Ten Commandments from God. So that's the Old Covenant. But in the Old Covenant that applied to Israel, they were not required to give a tithe. They were actually required to give two tithes each year and one tithe every third year. So is that the standard that you want to match or beat? You know, should we say, well, Christians need to give 25% then at least because we're under the new covenant. I don't think we'd say that. So that point of inference doesn't work. Uh, the second one is you'll hear, and this is true, that people tithe prior to the old covenant. And the point there is that the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, it, when we use them synonymously, was for Israel. And it ended, Jesus said. You know, there's going to be, Jeremiah promised, there's going to be a new covenant. Jesus said, I came not to annul it, to, to fulfill the old covenant. It's going to come to an end. And so people say, all right, there were, there were those who tithed before the, new, the old covenant, which only applied to Israel. Those, anything before applied to all mankind. And they look at the example of Abraham and Jacob. They say both of them tithed, and that's true, prior to the old covenant, that was before it was, you know, confined to Israel. So that applies to all mankind. Well, but you look at those situations, they are not typical in any sense. Abraham, you remember, he tithed after he won that battle and took possession of various things. He took the, the plunder from the enemy that he conquered, and he gave 10%, a tithe, to this man Melchizedek, who's a strange figure, a priest and a king of Jerusalem. Well, that's hardly typical because we don't know why Abraham did that. What compelled him? You know, we don't see anywhere that God told him to do that. We don't know why he did that. So that one you can hardly build a case on. The other one is Jacob. Jacob, you remember, he, uh, took, uh, he stole his brother's birthright. His brother said, hey, I'm going to kill you for that. And so Jacob got out of Dodge. On his way out, he promises God, if you bless me and bring me back, I will tithe to you. Well, that's hardly a typical principle for us. Hey, God, if you bless me, <laughs> get me out of trouble, then I'll tithe. I don't think anyone of us looked to that and say it, but I've heard many people say, well, there's two people that tithe prior to the Old Covenant. That means, you know, it's still sort of for us, even though it doesn't say so. I don't think that either. The third one that's often pointed to is Jesus. Jesus never commanded people to tithe, but he did commend the tithe. This is in Matthew chapter 23, 23 says there, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin. And so he's saying these spices with these little leaves, you tithe that. You know, you got these little leaves. And you're like, all right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine for me, one for God. Down to that degree. The thing goes on, and you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. So that was a part of the law, he admits. But you've neglected justice and mercy and faithfulness. Oh, yeah, those things. <laughs> then he makes this statement. These you ought to have done. What? The first, to tithe your mint and your dill and your cumin and everything else. You ought to have done that without neglecting the others. So Jesus commends the tithe there, and oftentimes that. Well, look, he commended it, so it must still be binding on Christians. But who was he talking to? Scribes and Pharisees people under the Old Covenant. Just like the Old Covenant didn't begin in Genesis, it didn't begin until Exodus chapter 20, it doesn't end until Acts 2. That's when the New Covenant starts. So even though Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in our New Testament, they are un still living under the Old Covenant. So he's saying to people under the Old Covenant, yeah, you were instructed to tithe. You need to do that. 
but, and then he makes the special point for them about the things they've been neglecting. So what is the New Testament standard for giving? Well, first of all, I guess we need to, you know, I always like going to the root of things and asking the basic question, is there any command or precedent for giving in the New Testament? Maybe we're not supposed to give at all. No, it's not that. It tells us in several places. First of all, it's commanded. Hebrews 13, 16. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So, do not neglect to do good in general, but specifically, share what you have. So, we are commanded to share what we have. 1 Timothy 6, 18. Talking to the rich of this world, you are to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share. So, not just good things, but you are to be generous and ready to share. And we might look at that and say, well, that only applies to the rich. I'm off the hook there. Well, realize that in Jesus' day, and matter of fact, up until fairly recently in the history of the world, there was no middle class. You were either poor and in need, or if you weren't, you were considered rich. You were rich. The middle class is a, a new innovation of culture and society. And so if you're not in, in need, then you're rich by that definition. So we are told to be rich in good works and to be generous. So to sacrifice, to be generous. First Timothy says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. What's that talking about? Well, the elders are the earthly leaders of the church. They're to be considered worthy of double honor. Well, what's the first honor? Being an elder, being recognized as an earthly leader of God's church. That's a, a position of honor and huge responsibility. The double honor is saying for those who rule well, so apparently, you know, some who were more inclined and did it more, you know, spent more time doing it, and certainly those who spent time laboring and preaching and teaching, the second honor is to be paid, is to be compensated for their time, and he goes on, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborer deserves his wages. So Paul makes it clear, that's what I'm talking about. Well, if the, the preacher is going to get paid, someone's got to give the money for the preacher to get paid. So we are told, certainly commanded, to give. There's also an example of giving. Acts chapter 2, verses 44 to 45, and then in chapter 3. It says, All who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Then down in chapter 3, There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and it was laid at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as he had any need. So there's this example. Now, a couple things about this. First of all, it is not socialism. That stuff that they had, it still belonged to them personally. They were not commanded. And it was not put all into some big pot, and they all said, all right, now let's take an equal share out of the pot. It's talking about people who had extra, people who had houses and lands. Well, it's not like they sold the one house they had, so now they're homeless and someone else has a house. No, they had, even then, there were people who had more than one house, had lands that they, they didn't need, and so they sold those. That money went to make sure that there was not a needy Christian in the church, and that's certainly something that should still be true. The early church's example, the other thing about this, this is an example. Well, we might think, well, that's what they did. Does that mean we should do it? Yes, because they were the early church. Uh, in the New Testament, specifically the book of Acts, but others, when the apostles are prescribing what should happen, that is not just descriptive. Well, look what they did. Wasn't it nice? It's prescriptive. Look what they did. We need to keep doing it as the church today. It's the reason we have the Lord's Supper every week. Never told to do that, but we see the New Testament church did that, and we view their example as prescriptive, not descriptive. So, and, and then you think about it, and throughout the Bible, there's a constant emphasis on the poor and making sure the poor among God's people are taken care of. So there's that example. So you have a command and a precedent for giving to meet the needs of the church, both the ministry needs, you know, the teaching and preaching, and the physical needs of members. But that still doesn't answer the question, what's the individual standard? All right, that stuff should be happening in a church. How much should I give, Steve? I'm still waiting to hear the answer to that one. All right, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 is often used for this. There's several verses in there that if you hear a series or a sermon on tithing, you're going to hear verses from those chapters. While there, are, while there is application for us, and we're going to make it today, one thing we need to realize, this is not talking about normal giving. It's not like just the normal Sunday giving for the needs of the church, the preacher, and the people in that church. It was a special collection being taken 
among churches outside of Jerusalem, away from Jerusalem, for the Jerusalem church because they were suffering a severe famine. And so that's what this was, the Jerusalem collection, it's called sometimes. Special case, but again, we can learn from it. So I want to read those two chapters. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. And I realize two whole chapters is a little more than we're used to. Uh, I won't spend the usual time, or you would need to bring a lunch today, and so we won't have you do that. But I do want to go through this because this is one of the main sections, and it does give us some input. Paul writes we, to the church in Corinth, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. So Macedonia was an area outside of Corinth, away from Corinth, but Corinth was familiar with it. Cor Corinth was in Achaia, Achaia, or Acacia, we're going to see, uh, Achaia. And so they were like neighbors, but very distinct. He says, For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. So they were undergoing affliction. It seems part of it was persecution for their faith. And he says, Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty. So they didn't have a lot physically, monetarily, but they had a lot of joy being a Christian. And out of that, it overflowed in a wealth of generosity. Their joy overcame their poverty, and they said, we want to give to this collection. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and he says, beyond their means, of their own accord, they chose to give this, to this special collection, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints in Jerusalem. They said to Paul, please let us give. We want to help those Christians who, where it all started, who helped bring the gospel to us so that we could have this salvation. He says in verse 5, and this not as we expected. Paul saying, we didn't expect these people to give because they were so poor themselves. He says, this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Well, what's that mean? They gave themselves first to the Lord. When they became a Christian, they committed to God. They gave themselves to Him, their hearts to Him. And so he says, now they're giving to us of their mon what little money they have toward this collection out of that commitment to God, just as we talked about. Accordingly, he says, in light of that, he's talking to Corinth here, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace, this offering. We're going to see what's happened here. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, we love you that much, see that you excel in this act of grace also. That verse is often quoted. You know, you're good at all these other things, make sure you're good at giving. True, but this was a special case. And look what Paul says in verse 8. I say this not as a command. I'm not telling you in Corinth to give to this offering, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. He's going to go on to say, you're the ones that said you wanted to give to this special collection out of your love for the church in Jerusalem. Paul realizes, if I tell you now, and what had happened, they had started giving and collecting, and in the time it took for Paul to get back around, it had slacked off, and the collection really wasn't what it should be or what they had you know, expressed it will be. And so Paul is sort of urging them. It's why he's going to send Timothy, you know, or Titus, excuse me, to get things back on track. But he says, I'm not commanding this. Why? Because if I command you to do it, then you're not doing it out of love. <laughs> if I say you have to, that's not love. He says, you started this in love. I want you to finish it in love, but I'm not commanding you. For you know, and here's he gives the example of Jesus. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Well, what's all that? Jesus was rich. He's God. He was in heaven. That's pretty rich. He became poor. He set aside. It says in Philippians, he emptied himself of that glory, in a sense, to come to earth, made himself poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. What? Rich spiritually. You would receive salvation. And in this matter, I give my judgment. So here is he saying, now, I'm not commanding you, but here's what I'm saying. And when an apostle says that you do, you know, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. When an apostle speaks, we need to listen. In this matter, I give my judgment. This benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So in other words, it was Corinth who said, hey, the people, the brothers in Jerusalem, the people who started it all and spread the gospel to us, they're suffering from this famine. Let's give some money to help them. Corinth came up with the idea. 
So now, verse 11, finish doing it as well so that your readiness in desiring it when you started may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that is a matter of fairness, that your abundance at the present time should supply their needs so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. We're going to talk about this a little more detail. And it, as it is written, he backs us up again with something from the Old Testament, something a little maybe strange from the manna being given. Whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. They were to gather a certain amount, but they didn't necessarily take out a container like that. They would go gathering, put it in their, their you know, the fold of their, their robe or something, bring it back. And if they intended to bring that, that's what they had. It would work out that way. If they intended to keep too much, that was trouble. And you see in the Old Testament what happened. But if they were trying to follow God, it all worked out. Well, verses 16 to 24, we're going to skip because those are details about the collection itself. Paul picking it up and taking it. Chapter 9. Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. Paul's saying, I don't need to write to you about the ministry of the saints, but what's he doing? He's writing to them about the ministry of the saints. So, and Paul has that. You know, it's, this is real life. We sometimes treat this as, you know, it is God's holy word, but it was one person writing to another inspired by God. So he's basically saying, you know, I don't really have to do this, but I'm going to do this. For I know your readiness, you're the ones who said, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia. Hey, these Corinthians, as soon as they heard about it, they said, let's take up a collection, saying that, the, saying that Acacia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. It was hearing about you that got these other people to say, we want to give. But I am sending the brothers so that your, our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready as I said you would be. So he's saying, before I get there, I'm sending Titus and some others on ahead just to make sure this collection's back on track. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me when I come to pick up the collection and find that you are not ready, we will be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift that you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction." Not as him coming and saying, hey, you got to give this much, pony up. Well, then there's another part here. We're going to look at this in detail. Point, or verse 6, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will provide thanksgiving to God. And he goes on. We're going to look at those in detail. But for the ministry of the service is not only supplying the needs of the saints back in Jerusalem, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. In other words, the people even in Jerusalem at this point saying, thank God that, that they're being generous and helping us. But their approval of this service, by their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. We're saying the church in Jerusalem is praying for you. They're, they probably were, but definitely now they're praying for you. All right, what can we gain from this passage? And I think there are two lessons, and it's interesting because you wonder at first how they fit together. The first principles comes from verses 12 and through 14 in chapter 8. Paul says, For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what a person does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their needs so that their abundance may supply your need and there may be fairness. Now, talking about the abundance of Jerusalem at the end, we don't know if he's talking about maybe one day they'll have money and you'll be in need, or maybe just the fact that, you know, spiritually they have an abundance because that's where the gospel started. But here's the thing we need to look at this and realize. As Paul talks about according to what you have, our giving should be proportional to what we have. Paul makes that clear. 
that is proportional in terms of generosity and sacrifice. We saw that those are traits for our giving. It talked about that in those previous verses. A sacrifice, generous. It is not talking about a proportionate in the matter of percentage. And sometimes people say, well, that's how a tithe works. You make a lot of money, 10% is more. You make less money, 10% is less. You know, it's proportionate. It's a proportionate percentage, but it's not proportionate in terms of generosity and sacrifice. You know, think about it. If some family makes $300,000 a year and ties $30,000, that is not the same. It's not proportionate in terms of sacrifice and generosity if another family makes $30,000 a year and ties $3,000 off of that. That family that's making $30,000 a year in our economy today is struggling. That family that's making $300,000 that gave away 10%, they're not. It's not the same. And that's what Paul is talking about according to what you have not according to what you don't have. A set percentage doesn't accomplish that. It doesn't accomplish it person to person, and it probably, for many of us, doesn't accomplish it in our lives. There's times when things are going real well. <laughs> There's times when it's struggling to get by. Well, that 10% is not proportionate genero- in terms of generosity and sacrifice. That percentage can change. What's it look like? Well, again, I think it's different percentages, different amounts, But also, realize this, the point is not that you end with the same. It's not saying, well, whoever's making a lot of money needs to give so much so that they're all equal to the people who aren't giving as much money. No, but it's saying they need to give in a way that their giving represents generosity and sacrifice, just like everyone, whatever that percentage is and the amount that comes from it. Then there's another point here that, again, is interesting. Verse 6 of chapter 9 says, The point is this, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. He's definitely talking about physical giving there. Sowing, giving. Whoever does it sparingly will reap sparingly, bountifully, bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. It needs to be something we want to do out of joy. And God, verse 8, is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he is distributed freely and he is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. You see what that passage is saying? That passage is saying that God will provide for us to be able to give and experience the joy of doing that. God will provide. Now, the implication there is it has to be out of joy. It can't be some investment scheme. You know, all right, if I give this money to God, I'm guaranteed a two, you know, a two times return on my money. That's better than the stock market. I'm going to take it. No. If I want to, like these Macedonians... They were begging Paul, Paul, please, we want to be able to give to these Christians in Jerusalem. We wouldn't be Christians without them. Please let us give. That's joy. Paul's saying, if you really want to give, if you really want to give, God will make it possible. That's what he's saying in all of these verses. God is able to make all grace abound to you. All grace, not just the grace of forgiveness of sins, but this grace of having enough to be able to give. God, that you may have sufficiency in all things at all times. As it is written, he's distributed freely. He is given to the poor. Verse 10, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for what? For sowing. God will give you enough to give. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. Now, we certainly need to realize that God's blessings are different than ours. That often is an issue. (laughs) God, you're going to bless me. Here's what I'd like. I've got a list ready. I'll make it easy for you. Just like Christmas shopping when you're a kid. Here, Mom and Dad, (laughs) just buy this. (laughs) God's blessings are different than ours. But there's clearly an element of material blessing included in that. You can't go to the opposite extreme and say, oh, there's nothing physical there. There's no guarantee. God." No, it says God's going to give you something that you can give physically, materially, financially. That's being promised too. Now, maybe not always will that be the case, he blesses, but that is one legitimate form of blessing. What's it look like? Well, I think the key question here is, will God provide for us to give generously before we decide in our heart or after? <laughs> in other words, say, God, you show me, show me the money, God, and then I'll promise to give to you. Or is there some, God, I'm going to promise to give and be generous and sacrifice. 
and we trust God. And now, what do we trust him for? One, we can trust to, you know, for him to provide enough for us. Two, we might have to trust for him to make me okay with the sacrifice that it entails on my part. God, you'll show me the true blessings here. Uh, verse uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 I uh, had in there, for we walk by faith, not by sight. This is to characterize our whole Christian life, and we're going to talk about this next week. It'll be the whole focus of the, the sermon is the faith of stewardship. But that is the idea. Paul says here, this balance, you know, how do the two principles fit together? Everyone's giving should, be, should evidence faith. Everyone's giving should evidence faith. That percentage and that amount will vary from person to person. So that's how those two fit together. So there is no command to tithe, but I will say this. I find it interesting how common that amount was. You know, it was the standard in the Old Covenant. Either though, even though they were commanded to give two tithes and one every three years, that was the standard. Give a tithe for this, a tithe for that, and a tithe every three years. It was done prior. Why did Abraham say 10%? Why did Jacob say 10%? We find that it was done by other nations. That was like a standard for their giving to their false gods. Financial advisors today will tell you, many of them, you need to give 10, save 10, and live off 80%. And I have found that for many people, the tithe does qualify as generous and sacrificial and a matter of faith. Not for everyone, but truly for most people, like, yeah, that's a chunk, that, that sacrifice, that's generous, and it takes faith. But it is according to what we have. Now, the question always gets answered, and I'll answer it now before someone comes up later. All right, T, Steve, are we talking about gross or net here? <laughs> well, realize the Bible doesn't command us to tithe, so it doesn't tell us gross or net. It goes back to what is sacrificial and what is generous for you right now at this point. That's what the Bible says. Like the New Covenant versus the Old Covenant in general, we are called to a higher standard as Christians. But God doesn't spell out that standard oftentimes for Christians. God leaves it up to us to do what it says in Colossians 2.6, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. doesn't spell out the details. You face something in life, all right? I'm walking, I'm living. What does that call me to do in this situation? The other thing, I will say this, one more thing. Since all our money is God's and our ability to earn comes from God, stewardship applies to all the money we have, not just giving back. So it's not like, all right, I gave this amount, the rest of it, I can do whatever I want with. Well, we're still to be good stewards because it's not ours, it's God's. Now, that doesn't mean we buy only necessities. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. It's okay to enjoy some of the things in this world that take some money to enjoy. There's a biblical balance here. And that's what we have to find under this age of grace. And one thing I would say is you've exceeded the balance if you have so much that you've got things going to waste. You've got things in a closet or store that you're never going to use and you just keep buying more. That's going too far. And we could talk more about that, but we don't have time. Which brings us to the stewardship of time. <laughs> so there's money. The other one we've been saying over and over is time. And time includes our talents, our abilities, because that's spending my time to use those things. And purposely, again, it's stewardship of time, not my time, because it is God's. My time, my life, I've been created by God. I'm being sustained by God. I'm the manager of this life he's given me. Now, is there a big question like there was with giving money? Like how much? I don't know if there's a big question here, but I think there should be. <laughs> I think we misunderstand this idea of stewardship of our time. You know, sometimes we don't ask the right question. Uh, we don't have the right answer because we don't even know the right question to ask. And I think, think sometimes that's true here, and I apologize because I think sometimes church leaders and preachers have contributed to this misunderstanding and misconception. I know one thing I've heard a lot, and I used to say in Scottsdale, Arizona, where I was preaching, is, you know, here's what we ask of your time. We would like you to worship one hour and serve one hour. And when you have small groups, we, you know, we'd like you to attend small groups for one hour. Well, one problem there is just worshiping one hour, but that's a whole other subject. But uh, there's that idea, worship one hour, serve one hour, and usually it applies to you know, a church with two services. Will you come and attend one of the worship services and then stay for the other one or vice versa and serve one in the nursery or something to help other people be able to attend? And it sounded so good, but what's it imply? 
Well, one problem is it leads to the mindset, well, if three is the ideal, two out of three ain't bad. And one's better than nothing. So you get that. But there's an even bigger problem with this, and that is that we see the rest of life as ours. If I give my three hours, or at least two, or, you know, maybe one, all the rest is mine <laughs> to do with as I want. Uh, as long as I'm not sinning, of course, and we define sinning as doing bad things, then I'm being a good steward of my time. Well, that is so missing the point and so missing the mark. The rest of the time is not ours. It's God's. He's the owner. We're the manager. And you know what? We are sinning if we don't view it the way he says to view it. Sinning isn't just doing those bad things we hear about. And the Ten Commandment version of bad, don't lie, don't steal. Sinning is missing the mark of what God wants us to do. So if we're not using the rest of our time and viewing it the way God says, that's sin. That's missing the mark. You know, we saw in the parable of the talents, a talent equals opportunity. Opportunity to do what? To live for God, to live out our faith. Whenever we're faced with a, an opportunity to live out our faith, we need to do what God would want us to do. We need to distinguish serving versus living. Sometimes we think, you know, all right, I serve this much time. Well, serving is living. As a Christian, my life is my service. What's the Bible say about this? Well, there's a few key passages. First one talks about these opportunities. We've seen it a couple times. Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. It says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. That is saying, as you go through life, every opportunity for what? <laughs> to live out my Christian life. I need to use that in a way that's wise. I need to do what God would have me do. Going back to our main idea, live out my Christian life. An opportunity. And that's not just an opportunity to serve in the nursery, an opportunity to mow the yard at church. It's an opportunity standing in line at Walmart to, to help someone. It's an opportunity, as I've said over and over, to get together and share a meal with other believers. It's an opportunity to do, how do I use my time? Am I using it as a way that's as wise as God would say or as foolish as the world would have us do? God's workmanship. This is another principle that impacts how we use our time, how we use our talents. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship, His work of art, His unique masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, when? Before He created the world, that we should walk in them. I just do them here or there, walk continually and live. What's that saying? Every one of us is created entirely, totally unique. There's no one like you. God has placed things in our path that fit us exactly. He's prepared these good works beforehand. They fit together. I can do it. God's gifted me to do that. Whenever I'm faced with that situation, I need to use my gift the way God would have me use my gift in the way that he's prepared an opportunity for me to use it. And this is not just a sidelight. Sometimes we forget, we read this verse. Are you familiar with the two verses in front of it? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10 says, For by this grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Those are like two of the main verses about salvation right there. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And what's the very next verse? For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This isn't just some sidelight of the Christian life. Paul's saying it all goes together. You were saved. You were forgiven. You're no longer going to hell. What should we be doing now? Using our gift every chance we have. That's what it means to be a steward of our time. Our mission is the last thing that I would bring up that, you know, gives us insight into how I should steward my time, the time God has given me, God's time. Verse 18 of Matthew 28, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's telling us how to use our time. It's telling us how to manage the time God has given us. Every Christian, we talked about this yesterday some, sometimes we think, well, that's the church's job. No, every Christian, as I go, as I'm going, as I'm going to work, as I'm going to the stores, I'm going about my routine, I am to be making disciples. That's what it means to be a good steward of the time God has given me. 
a lot today. I realize that. The heart of things in one sense, we do need some specifics. Now that we know the focus and the foundation, all right, what does it look like? And that's what I want you to wrestle with at this point. And it's going to take more than just this time this morning. I want you to look at this and ask yourself some questions. First of all, regarding my stewardship of money, what did I learn today? How does it compare to how I am managing the money God entrusted to me? And what will I do to change? And then ask those same things about time. What did I learn today? <laughs> how does it compare to how I am managing the time God has entrusted to me? And what will I do to change? I would say that every one of us can look at that and find some way of what I've learned isn't the same as what I'm doing, so what do I need to do to bring those two into alignment? And I would encourage you again, share that with other people, talk, discuss, get together, and, and bring out what does God want me to do. God has great things in store for us. God has done good things for us. He's given us our life itself. He's asked us to be good stewards of it. Okay, let's stand together. Um, we do our best to uh, kind of create a theme each Sunday and choose songs that would support the preaching of God's Word, but there's not a whole lot out there that says, give your money and give your time. So we're going to end with just singing about God and His greatness and a lot of heartache represented in this room this morning. And uh, if you can't get into this joyful tune, just soak in the words of the greatness of God. No matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what's going on in this crazy world, God is always the same. He never changes. And just, uh, just take joy in the, the declaration of the words of this song. Let's sing it together.
every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things, we dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's go out singing that. Oh, 